Driving along Georgia Highway 49, as it crosses from Houston County to Bibb County, heading toward the communities of Rutland, Walden, and Avondale, you pass by woodlands dotted with the occasional home, business, or farm. What are now woodlands were once fields. Looking past the trees, one can imagine the end of the plantation era with the Civil War and the beginning of the time of tenant agriculture, a new period in history. Bibb County, Georgia was established in 1822. Agriculturally productive lands along creeks and rivers were quickly bought and made into plantations. By 1830, Bibb County had a population of 7,154, nearly 42 percent of whom were enslaved Africans. Planters mostly grew cotton, which was sent to Macon by wagon, and then shipped downriver to Savannah and on to textile factories in Europe and the Northeast. While the Civil War brought plantation slavery to an end in 1865, many African Americans remained on the former plantations, working as tenant farmers on the same land their slave ancestors had worked before them. African American tenant farmers were members of a close-knit community. Marriages between families built connections. Groupings of tenant houses were found on former plantation land, and while tenants and their families would have worked individual fields, they would have come together for religious services, weddings, funerals, and other social events. Living in rural areas, like Southern Bibb County, African American tenants would have occasionally traveled to the small towns of Walden and Avondale for church services and other functions. As African Americans left the region, some fields were abandoned and became wooded. A landscape was lost, forgotten, but clues to its past remain. That wooded triangle in the corner of Landlot 130, it was never used for agriculture. Why not? What happened there? At this wooded triangle, the Georgia Department of Transportation and African American history intersected on the Sardis Church Road Extension Project, which will connect Interstate 75 to Hawkinsville Road and the Middle Georgia Regional Airport. The Sardis Road Extension Project was really in its sort of final phases. The environmental had been cleared and the property uh, for the road was in the acquisition phase. Uh, an appraiser in our right-of-way office contacted us because in the negotiations they had had a uh, conversation with Mr. Lucas where he was a little uncertain um, about whether his historic property had been uh, properly evaluated during the environmental process. So the right-of-way office contacted me. I made contact with Mr. Lucas and we met here on site to look at a historic building um, that he owns. In the process of that, as I was about to leave, he pointed over to a wooded area and um, stated that there was a, a slave cemetery. Um, in that area and ask if, if we were aware of that and um, it's where the road was going to go and I, I told him that we were not aware and that I would investigate that and th so that really was the initiation of the project. She was taken to this wooded triangle of land 
which the neighboring landowner had been told was once an African-American cemetery. A few years ago, we were contacted by DOT to meet them out here, and uh, they were talking about a project that they were considering at the time of extending Sardis Church Road into Avondale Road. He told me that they had shifted the road over to to miss his home because it seemed like it had significant historical importance. I said, well, what about the graveyard? He said, what graveyard, Mr. Lucas? I said, over there in the woods. The whole cemetery was fenced in at one time. The farmer over there had cattle grazing out there and, and he kept the fence up so the cattle couldn't get into the, to the uh, cemetery area. The cemetery contained no monuments, markers, or other visible evidence of human burials. But through archeological testing, the Georgia Department of Transportation, or GDOT, confirmed that graves were present. GDOT archeologist Sarah Gale used several techniques to identify the number of graves in the cemetery. Members of Alpha Team Search and Rescue were asked to bring their search and rescue dogs to the site. These dogs have been used to find human remains in various settings, and they have received training that allows them to identify human burials. Multiple dogs and trainers worked the area independently. All of the dogs marked locations where their sense of smell indicated burials might be found. Next, ground penetrating radar, or GPR, was used to create a three-dimensional view below the ground surface. GPR also identified burials in the area. The presence of burials was confirmed with test trenches. Due to an established cemetery on one side and wetlands on the other, the proposed road could not be shifted to avoid the burial ground. In order to preserve and protect the remains, the decision was made to recover and relocate these graves. New South Associates, a cultural resources management firm, was hired to conduct this relocation. Since there were no records of a cemetery and it had no name, the project team called it the Avondale Burial Place because of its proximity to Avondale Mill Road. Under the direction of Dr. Hugh Maternus, New South used a backhoe to strip away the soil to where they could see stains in the ground left by the grave shaft. Soil stains, which archaeologists call features, are left where soil is dug up, mixed, and redeposited. The archaeologists were able to identify the locations of grave shafts as rectangular stains in the red clay. 101 burials were identified at the Avondale Burial Place. The archaeologists then began the process of excavation. Our initial expectation was that we were going to have a small group of individuals who are out here placed in a fairly tightly defined area. And we discovered that that was not the case at all. And in fact, we had three different groupings that are present. In African American communities, your families were very tightly knit uh, social units. And you tended to bury with your own kinfolk. Most of the African Americans here in the South uh, some of the poor white farmers um, are people that are not terribly well represented in the historical record and we don't know a whole lot about them. They didn't leave a lot of, of traces behind and one of the best resources we can have to tell their story, to put them back into history and back into people's minds, actually comes from the cemeteries. We get a large cross-section of their life represented out here we learn a lot about the way they thought about things, what types of materials they had. The skeletons tell us an enormous amount of information about their lifestyle. The cemeteries in themselves, the way they're laid out, they tell us a lot about the way they viewed the world. For me, this is very exciting to be able to find a community where we know practically nothing about them and be able to reconstruct their world and tell their story. It gives them back a social identity, a social presence, which unfortunately they've lost through the passage of time.
What happened to the families whose loved ones were buried at the Avondale Burial Place? Who were they? Where did they go? Federal census records were used to map the locations of African-American tenant families in the areas surrounding the cemetery in the late 19th century. These names were then used to search for potential descendants. GDOT hosted open houses during the project, sent notices to local African-American churches, sponsored talks and presentations on the project, and generated press releases, all in the hopes of identifying descendants. Sharman Southall searched genealogical websites for descendants. Her efforts were met with success. She identified the descendants of two families, one African-American and the other white, who had lived in the project area. After Mama died in 1961, I was going through some of her papers and I found a newspaper article back from 1943 from the Macon paper about this uh, MacArthur property in Bibb County and about a quilt that had been made for one of the descendants. This article told about uh, John MacArthur having come to Middle Georgia in the early 1840s and bought property there. The article told about where it was at the end of the runway of um, the Macon Airport, which was then called Cochrane Field. And and then I, I went from there to looking up census records, uh, wills, deeds, cens uh, and uh, anything like that. But the, the will of John MacArthur that was written, I think it was 1846, was the, the thing that really uh, gave me this interest in the MacArthur family. When I read about the, the different uh, things that he was giving to his children and attached to the the will was an inventory of his uh, property, uh, beds, furniture, uh, even wheat and cotton and things like that. And it included um, 12 slaves and their names and ages. And uh, that was the first that I knew of my ancestors having been slave owners. Tallery Boyd and Reverend Skip Mason were descendants of Ellen Barton and Harney Thomas, two African-American women who were likely born as slaves on the MacArthur Plantation. The Barton and Thomas family names were frequently identified in federal census records for the surrounding area. I consider myself one of the uh, most blessed, I won't say lucky, but really one of the most blessed persons in the world because my family history research has sort of come full circle. Now with the discovery of this, this cemetery and these 101 remains, uh, of which we believe very strongly that there are some in there who are, are related. Very few people get the opportunity to trace their family back, but even more so to have a cemetery associate, associated with it and to have the discovery of these remains, you know, and to do research and to learn how they lived and how they survived and what conditions were. When I was first approached about it, you know, I was a little bit ambivalent about it. I had some mixed emotions. Why move them? You know that they're there. Let them rest in peace. You know, why disturb them? Uh, can't you reroute and, and redo this, this highway now that you know that? But, you know, after I listened, you know, to some of the rationale uh, of, you know, what would happen, and what intrigued me most uh, was the fact that they were going to study the remains. And that said a lot not just dig the remains up and move them and put them somewhere else. For me, I found that to be a lot real disrespectful just to get a highway in, but that they were going to study them. And the fact that there might be the possibility of doing DNA testing. For me, it, 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 it soothed my soul and many of my family members uh, were also calmed by the fact that there would be opportunities for research. Like many other African-American families from southern Bibb County, the descendants of Ellen Barton and Harney Thomas
began to leave Georgia for other parts of the country in the early 20th century. When the Civil War ended, uh, many of the African Americans that were now freed people began to disperse as they could not find uh, additional employment or as the farms were changing hands and uh, many African Americans began the diaspora to other parts of Georgia. The life of a tenant farmer was very difficult. By the early 20th century, Southern African Americans began leaving the region in search of jobs in the industrial cities of the Northeast and Midwest. World War I and the Immigration Act of 1924 increased the need for industrial workers in cities such as Baltimore, Chicago, and New York. Racial tensions in the South and violence by the likes of the Ku Klux Klan spurred African Americans' desire to leave the region. Millions of African Americans left the South from the early 20th century through the 1970s in what became known to historians as the Great Migration. This migration was felt in Bibb County. In a September 1916 article, the Macon Telegraph commented, Everybody seems to be asleep about what is going on right under our noses. That is, everybody but those farmers who have wakened up on mornings to find every Negro over 21 on his place gone, to Cleveland, to Pittsburgh, to Chicago, to Indianapolis, and while our very solvency is being sucked out beneath us, we go about our affairs as usual. Of the 101 burials at Avondale, 63 were infants and children, a large number that reflects the difficult lives and early deaths of African-American tenant farming families. Charms such as pierced coins and beads worn for spiritual protection were found with many of the burials. One artifact found with a young child reflected the simpler aspects of life. I was working my way from the, from the head to the feet and as I got to the upper arm, I found something white. And I thought at first it was a shell, which is a, a pretty typical inclusion in African-American graves. And, and as I uncovered it, I started uncovering the face and it just sort of um, exposed her, her little face and then her hands. It was as if the, the little girl, about two or three years old, was was cradling it in her arm. Um, the mother or family lovingly placed the doll in with the child when they, when they, before they buried her. The nails coming out of the screens provide a, a wealth of information if you record the data correctly on these. When we're in the field, we make a diagram of each of the individual interments. And as you can see the little dots on here, these indicate where each of the nails are placed, where they were originally located. We record the depths of these as well that tell us uh, where the nails were found originally. And from this, we can reconstruct the shape and the form of the type of receptacle that the individuals were buried in. Archaeologists discovered coffin hardware, items such as handles, thumb screws, and viewing plates. The style of coffins found at the site provided clues to a family's economic condition. While most of the coffins were of a very simple construction and were probably locally made, others were more formal with ornate hardware which suggests that some families were able to spend more on a funeral. Coffin hardware is extremely important to us. From an archaeological perspective, it, is, it appears in a very short period of time, and we can use this to precisely date some of the coffins and then some of the graves. For the people who are using these coffins, it served both functional and symbolic purposes. The archaeologists studied and recorded the shapes of the burial shafts themselves. Several of the burials were placed in vaulted shafts. A grave shaft was dug, and then a coffin vault was placed in its base. 
Wooden planks were then placed over the coffin vault to protect the coffin from the weight of the dirt when the grave shaft was backfilled. All of the 101 graves from the Avondale burial place were oriented with the dead facing east towards the rising sun. The organization of the burials was informal, with gaps between rows, suggesting family groupings. No historic records of the cemetery were found. Graves with simple coffins and few remains were difficult to date and could have been placed at any time from settlement in the 1820s to the late 19th century. Some artifacts, such as a campaign token from William Henry Harrison's 1840 presidential campaign found around the neck of one of the deceased, indicate that people may have been buried at Avondale Burial Place prior to emancipation. However, archaeologists were able to date the majority of the burials from 1870 to 1890 by identifying various types of coffin hardware, clothing, and other items. Physical anthropologist Valerie Davis analyzed the bones to determine the age, sex, health, and race of the individuals. When we bring skeletons back from the field, I pull them out of the tissue paper and I clean them up using paintbrushes and toothbrushes. Then I do all of my metric analysis so that I can see if they were males or females, how old they were, diseases they may have had, maybe what they died from, and I do that using my calipers, different kinds of calipers for different kinds of measurements. And I record everything on the, my skeletal forms so that when I write my report, I have all the information right there in front of me. This analysis and DNA testing conducted at the University of Oklahoma confirmed that these were the remains of African Americans. The analysis showed that the Avondale Burial Place community performed hard physical labor, they had poor nutrition and inadequate health care. Damage to bone joints in the arms and legs of adults showed that many had literally worn out their bodies long before becoming old. Over half of the burials in the cemetery were infants and children, a much higher percentage than what would have been found in European American populations at the time. Like other African American families in the South, Many of the descendants of Ellen Barton and Hardy Thomas left Georgia for other parts of the country in the early 20th century. They settled in New York, Illinois, Florida, and various other states. For over 25 years, members of the Barton and Thomas families have held reunions where genealogical research, old photos and documents, and oral traditions are shared. As attendance at these reunions has grown, lost connections have been restored. Lorenzo Wilder, Thomaston, Georgia. Tawanda Myrie from Queens, New York. Eloise Byron, Tampa, Florida. Gabby Burnett from Deaconsburg, Georgia. Mary Borden from Uniondale, New York. Jalen Scott, Jacksonville, Florida. Morgan Wilder from Hyattsville, Maryland. Keon Clements, Loma City, Georgia. Beverly Redfield, Cleveland, Ohio. Cheryl Robbins, Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Lisa Wilder, Clayton, North Carolina. Paulette Downing, Cleveland, Ohio. John Wilder Sr., Augusta, Georgia. Karen Castillo Payne, West Palm Beach, Florida. Reverend Henry Byron, Tampa, Florida. A reunion was held in Macon, Georgia on Memorial Day 2010.
During the reunion, descended families visited the burial site to observe the excavation, ask questions of the archaeologists, and commemorate the dead. We just came together and met each other and then now to find out that we have ancestors that were buried here is fascinating. The more we search out and try to find out different little things, it seems like they're opening up paths to let us know, okay, you need to go this route. And maybe look more into this. I don't know, I just feel like that sometimes, like a lot of the things that I research, that the spirits are there to guide me a little bit because they know I'm searching for them, so they're going to help me out and find them. So eventually I think we'll kind of get a little bit more of a feel of the family structures of who are really buried here, and if indeed, if they are my ancestors. Nobody even knew this place existed. So by us uncovering it, it's like, we're remembering them in some kind of way, even if they're not related to me. Yeah, I still feel a connection. Give you thanks right now, Lord, for this beautiful day, this wonderful, gorgeous day, Lord. Uh, on the back of your shirt, you have a scripture that comes from the book of Ezekiel. And it says, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord, and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, as we've seen today, the bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, O oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Well, I have prayed and asked God for some confirmation whether or not these bones live. Mm -hmm. And the answer is yes. These bones live in us. Right. We are the descendants of these people, our ancestors, those we know and those we don't know. I think uh, all who are here uh, have uh, been uh, incredibly enlightened uh, and it's been a life-changing experience for many of us to see you know, what happens after we commit uh, our uh, beloved and loved ones to the earth. The remains from the Avondale burial place were reburied at nearby Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Descendants of the Barton, Thomas, and MacArthur families and others attended a memorial service at this new burial ground in February 2012. The Avondale Burial Place 
was an African-American cemetery created sometime in the 19th century and used into the early 20th century by tenant farmers. The discovery and analysis of the Avondale Burial Place helps us to understand African-American life and death in the rural South, to bring light to a historic African-American place and give new life to old bones. The Avondale Burial Place, once forgotten, is now remembered.